Hi, and welcome to a special presentation of the Be Healthistic podcast, presented by Healthy Directions. Today, we're going to be focusing on the impact that blood sugar can have on our heart health and how this relationship is truly integral to our overall health and well being. Now, obviously, this is a topic very close to my heart, no pun intended, because cardiology was my dad, Dr. Stephen Sinatra's specialty, and we've talked about this topic quite a bit on this podcast in previous seasons. Now, when we think about blood sugar, we tend to automatically connect it to diabetes, which we all know has become a silent epidemic here in the US. But blood sugar, insulin levels and insulin resistance, cholesterol levels, weight, these are all factors that determine our cardio health too. And we need to realize that all of these systems are connected. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing this topic with internal medicine specialist and my Healthy Directions colleague, Dr. Ken Ooh. Redcross, whose experience being an internist will add a lot of value and expertise to the conversation. Welcome, Dr. Ken. Oh, thank you for having me on, Drew. I've been waiting. Thank you, finally, <laughs> finally, finally. finally it's good happened. to be connected. Exactly, exactly. No, thank you for having me on. I, I, I've seen it from afar and had so much admiration and love for your father. So oh, thank, thank you for you. bringing me on. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to first uh, give our listeners some stats here on diabetes because it's mind blowing, actually, when you think about what's happening in this country. Um, so according to the CDC, there are 96 million Americans yeah. over the age of 18 that have prediabetes. OK, yeah, yep. and that's 38 percent of the population. And that's not taking into consideration those that are under 18 years old. Right. And then we know that 11.3 percent of the population or 37 million Americans have type 2 diabetes. That's right. Okay? So this is just mind blowing. You think about how much we are struggling with blood sugar issues in this country. And so today we're going to talk about why this is happening and also some solutions to help improve blood sugar for people. Yeah, no, thank you. And this is just so important. You know, I see it so differently in my office lots of times. And like you say, we're talking about 90 million people who are suffering in silence and don't know. Yes. Um, and so this is so big that we're on here. So once again, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I guess, you know, when you have someone come into you, what what for you sets off some alarm bells that we may be dealing with a blood sugar issue? You know, one of the bigger things that I that I notice that we'll see a lot in, in America and a lot of it is our is our diet is those who are either what we call obese or those that we call overweight. Yeah. That is a, it's a big, big risk factor. And it's most of the of America at this point. So anytime I see that, Drew, it always starts me kind of peeling back the layers of the onion to look for other things that could also be predisposing them to that and increase blood sugar. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure our listeners are obviously familiar with high blood sugar and what that means, but let's talk about the connection with insulin here and the, the role that insulin plays in the body. So can you tell our listeners about the importance of insulin and why we're talking about it? Yeah. So look, everyone, you know, Insulin is one of the magnificent things that our that our body makes. It comes out of the, the pancreas and it's important to help drive that sugar that's in our blood sugar that we eat or what have you, but drive it into the cell where it does so many important things. But what we've learned is that when we are not at the correct weight, whether we're overweight or obese, it doesn't really matter how much insulin is kind of circulating around. The body's almost agnostic saying, well, what is that actually? It doesn't recognize it. And right. so therefore you can check the insulin levels and they look fine, but the blood sugar is going up because your body's not reacting. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, looking at insulin, do you measure like a fasting insulin on people and just get that in understanding of what's happening there? You know what? I don't really necessarily always do the fasting insulin. I mean, one of the things I do in everyone, I always mention, and you'll hear it with no matter what, even if you're not diabetic, it's called a hemoglobin A1C. I actually check that everyone. And that's a measurement of the amount of sugar on a red blood cell over a three month interval. So it kind of allows me to window shop or look in your home and see a little bit of what's happening when you're not in there with me. And if that number is over 5.7 or yeah. even equal to 5.7, you do know you're at risk. Um, you're already kind of at glucose intolerance level right there. Yep. Yeah. Once you've entered over that 5.7 range, that's when you're in the quote, you know, pre-diabetes range. There you go. There you um, go. Which is, which is good in a way because now we have evidence that, hey, we need to really work on your blood sugar, talk about exercise, talk about diet, maybe some supplements to help bring that down, which we'll, we'll get into later today. Absolutely. Um, now, what about, what about the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Can you help our listeners understand that? I can. So everyone, so type 1, I don't see so much in my office. And the reason why I say that, they're usually already seen by the specialist for hormones called an endocrine. Chronologist. Type 1 tends to be caught a little bit younger, call it um, kind of young adulthood, 
um, as far as adulthood when you get type two typically, but it's more of an autoimmune disease. That means to everyone that your body's kind of fighting those cells in the pancreas that I talked about, they're called the islets of Langerhans. They're kind of fighting that cell and we're learning more and more about those autoantibodies that we're called. So that's the one that's always going to require insulin, right? Because they don't have it. Type two, as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, can be done with some things that we can control and not always insulin, but sometimes insulin plays a role. Um, So that one and two, you're going to see mainly type two. And that's the one that we really, really can control and why we're really talking about this today. Exactly. And also, too, we should note that, you know, a type one diabetic, they don't fit the profile, so to speak, as a type two diabetic. So you might see someone that's really thin and say to yourself, well, how could they have diabetes? They they're really thin. But no, that's just because they're they're lacking insulin and they need to be taking insulin. And so different situation there. Absolutely, Drew. Thank you for mentioning that, Drew, that 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 was that was key to spring in there because it doesn't appear that they're the type diabetic that you see in type two. But like you said, they are so, so different in the way they're managed yeah. um, and in the etiology or the causes of the diabetes as well. Yeah, exactly. All right, so so we're painting this picture of diabetes right now and people are thinking to themselves, okay, one in three Americans essentially have an issue with blood sugar. Let's talk about the reasons for that occurring. So right off the bat, diet, you mentioned it. Let's talk about the, the standard American diet and why that's... Oh causing such blood sugar issues for people. Oh my gosh. I don't know how much time we have today on the (laughs) podcast when you talk about our diet. All right. So, you know, the diabetic diet, well, I'm sorry, the um, American diet isn't a great one, everyone. Um, It's one that predisposes us to a a lot of fat, a lot of salt, a lot of sugar, all the above. Um, And we talked a little bit about the being overweight or obese and those sort of things, but you're also getting some other disease states that are really making it worse, right? Hypertension. Yes. High cholesterol. All of those get intertwined to really cause some mega issues and challenges that we all get, especially when you look at our diet at our diet in the United States. Yeah. And I mean, the symptoms that you just mentioned there, if we add on a couple, we enter into the realm of metabolic syndrome. Right. Yes. So we're talking about high blood, uh, high blood sugar, yep. high blood pressure. We have the abdominal, you know, obesity there, elevated triglycerides, dyslipidemia, low HDL. Uh, and that's a constellation, really, of, of signs and symptoms that people have that kind of puts them into that category of metabolic syndrome. No, absolutely. And Drew, I'm glad you mentioned that when you talk about the um, the obesity and the abdomen, everyone. You know, we always talk about this BMI sort of story. Yes. Everyone's like, oh, my BMI is here, my BMI high. Look, the research starting to show it's really more about the waist circumference. We're seeing that it's the waist ratio that may be even more important than BMI, which can actually... Um, be different for certain ethnicities and certain groups and that sort of thing. So that waist circumference that you're mentioning, and that's a big thing to kind of keep in mind as well. Exactly. You know, and and two, we talked about diet briefly here in terms of just how poor it is in in the United States. And I'm going to give an example really quickly of how I went to Greece recently and and, and really got a different perspective on how they're eating differently than we are. Absolutely. But I want to point this out to people because this is super important, is that the, the food companies are unfortunately in control of us, right? It's, it's a reality. When you go to the supermarket, there's all this advertising on the boxes that kind of lure you in. I mean, I know my kids, when I'm walking down the aisle, they're saying, hey, could we get that? Because there's a cartoon figure on it. I mean, yeah. there's programming that's happening from a young age. And also, too, there's ingredients in this food, particularly like sugar, yeah. that we get hooked on, that we get addicted to. And so, you know, it's, it's not our fault, per se, that we're having elevated blood sugar issues these days. I, I tend to blame a lot of it on the food industry because there's no regulation around it. You can go out and buy sugar all you want and start eating yep. it. And no one's going to tell you that it's bad for you really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And unfortunately we're just, we're just fueled by our addictions and, and it's, it's like, I'm, I'm just getting more fed up as time yeah, goes on with our food industry because nothing's being done about it. And you can just do whatever you want and buy whatever sugary food, high refined carbohydrate food you want, eat it. And it's not good for you. No, you're right. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it's really like you say, it's, it's the wild, wild west. Yeah. I mean, imagine everyone when we, we've talked about this at the, at the top of our, of our segment about how much how many people we have running around with blood sugar and don't even know it. Imagine if instead, everyone, we now put labels to kind of earmark some of those foods you're talking about, Drew, to say, hey, guys, you can enjoy this, but this may cause metabolic syndrome. Enjoy. Yes. No. It wouldn't be taken. And so if we really decided and as a society decided we wanted everyone really healthy and we know the things that are good for us. And you're mentioning in Greece and the Mediterranean diet, that's something else we could chat about as mm-hmm. well. 
But the importance there, imagine if we did that with each one of those food products, yes. how our longevity would increase, how our health would improve. So you're right. It's kind of a it's kind of a big kind of game. And so luckily, mm -hmm. podcasts like yours, Drew, bring this to light so that everyone can say, you know, I, you know, they have a point there. Yeah, exactly. So here's my experience from Greece. And I think you traveled to Europe, too, this summer. So maybe we'll compare our experiences. There we go. Uh, but when I was in Greece, you know, it, you might have a croissant. OK, just like people might have a croissant here. Now, the croissant is, is not sugary it's just it's a savory uh pastry okay right and with that croissant they may give you some sliced cheese or some sliced meat that might you know balance out a little added fat protein right yeah uh, help reduce that insulin response that your body's going to have um and, and they might have you know some some yogurt with some fruit uh you know a traditional greek breakfast is also with olives and feta cheese right. so you're, you're incorporating more than just a muffin that's high in sugar or a bagel uh, you know, or another pastry that's just loaded with refined carbohydrates and sugar. And to top it off too, I always, I always tell people, I mean, think about it, it the, the classic American breakfast might be like coffee, which is fine, right. but you're layering in tons of sugar into that. And then you're that's having right. your, your muffin with that. And then you're chasing it down with a glass of orange juice, that's right. just setting you up for poor glucose regulation in the body. No, absolutely. And one of the things you mentioned with that Mediterranean breakfast, everyone, it's the portion size. The yes. portion size is also very, very different when you're there in Greece and you have that Mediterranean diet balancing beautiful things like olives um, mm -hmm. and, and those things that are so important, nuts, seeds, things that we don't necessarily have in our diet. That's really, really important um, to make sure we're getting all that we need out of our food and not all those added calories from the sugar that you're mentioning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we can't stress enough people listening that like diet is just so, so key with this. And, and we could we could just talk for so long about it. Let, let's briefly segue into exercise and really yeah. importance of, of and I like to say movement, too, because I think exercise triggers people sometimes. Yeah. But really move your body as much as you can. Right. Yeah. So even if you're listening to this podcast, maybe go for a walk with your with your phone in your pocket, go for a walk, get some exercise while listening to it. Uh, you know, get up from your desk on a regular basis, try to walk around the neighborhood, whatever it is, just move your body in any way that you can. Because when you do that, you're going to have much more efficient regulation of your blood sugar and it'll help lower blood sugar too. Like if you've ever known a type one diabetic, you know, before the insulin pumps are really big and they can kind right. of, you know, right. figure out exactly what insulin dose they needed in that moment, they'd have to go for a run around the neighborhood to like lower their blood sugar quickly after yep. a meal. So yep. it, it, it's testament there that like we need to be moving our bodies more. So I wanted to hear from you. What what do you recommend for exercise for those that are suffering from you know blood sugar imbalance? So so Joe, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm old enough to remember when the type one diabetics had to run around before the <laughs> pumps got so big. Okay, and so you're absolutely right. So when I talk about exercise, I tell everyone the CDC says we're supposed to be getting 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise mm -hmm. or 90 minutes a week of high intensity exercise. So if you think about that 150 minutes a week, guys, it's, it's only 30 minutes a day. Um, and so you can pile in other days and so forth. But the point is you get almost a 20 to 25 percent reduction in mortality. You're here on this earth 20 percent longer, everyone, in essence, yeah. when you're getting the right amount of exercise. And so when everyone thinks of exercise, they always think about the heart, which we should. But we're talking about blood sugar. And what happens is, guess what? Not only does your heart get the benefit, but when those muscles are moving, guess what they need, everyone? It needs glucose. Yes. It needs sugar. So therefore, it drives in there to make sure that you can walk. And also, I should say, too, the other studies have shown. Now, I am a big fitness enthusiast, cycler, crossfitter. But the study showed maybe I'm the crazy one because you can get the same benefits from a brisk walk. Right. After dinner, almost, depending on, you know, your, your speed and that sort of thing. And that's one of the big things with you being out in Greece and talking about the Mediterranean diet. They looked at the studies, Drew, and they saw that one of the big things they did, not only did they eat better than us, but they usually walk after dinner. Yes. And that may be a reason why their blood sugars are not like ours and their incidence of diabetes isn't like ours. So when you talk about and I'm glad you use the word movement, because I say that, too, because exercise is different for each one of us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is to move that body for that amount of time that I mentioned to really get the benefits. And I always mention, too, to people, even mentioning the word gym 
it can be <laughs> triggering, right? They're like, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't like the yeah. gym. Right. So, right. you know, find something that you enjoy doing. Maybe it's swimming, maybe it's hiking, maybe it's cycling, like what you're doing or CrossFit, but right. you know, something that you enjoy doing. Cause if you're not enjoying what you're doing for movement exercise, the reality is you're not going to do it. It's not going to last. It's not, not going to last. Happen. And the good thing is, like I said, I'm very serious. Everyone, they showed that walking the right pace in the right amount of time just is equal to, to me being crazy, lifting weights left and right, racing <laughs> um, to get the exact same benefit for your blood sugar and for yeah. your cardiovascular health. So that's something for those who, like you, don't want to see that gym. There's other ways you can do it at home. Yeah, exactly. Now, for people that want more objective evidence uh, of their blood sugar and where they're going with it, obviously, you know, you can get your labs done. We can do the, the fasting glucose. We can do the hemoglobin A1C, you know, maybe a fasting insulin if we want to kind of check in on that yeah, parameter. That's right. What's your thought on the continuous glucose monitors and how people that don't have prediabetes or diabetes, should they be using one? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Look, it, it, it's a tough one, Drew, because, you know, we're talking about 90 million people out there. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about people who really that we know needed as far as type two diabetics who really could get a benefit. So, look, I, I like to err on the side of caution. So mm. I, I, I would love for them to monitor that along with that, Drew, a lot of what we're doing on your, on your podcast today, educating around it, too. Yeah. Um, and it allows me to educate when they have that kind of glucose monitor, even if it's a little bit of overkill, it seems. Look at the lives we save um, when we educate like this and they're able to say, you know, Doc, we have a, a conversation now about your blood sugar and now becomes top of mind. Yes. Um, so I kind of like it. Um, but once again, I, I realize it may be a little over the top, but I'd rather be over the top in this. Yeah. Case yeah. Talk about blood sugar. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I definitely recommend them when people do have prediabetes to kind of yeah. gain that understanding of like, oh, you know what? I just had this glass of orange juice or I just had this, uh, this glass of uh, my latte, my oat milk. Right. Mm -hmm. And to see the, the, the glucose spike that happens from that, I think it just helps build awareness around the foods that you're eating, the drinks you're consuming and how that's influencing your blood sugar, including exercise too. You can see it drop after you've done a run or something, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, it's it's tough because I think insurance doesn't cover a lot of these continuous glucose monitors. No. And so, you know, you send in the prescription and then you got to do a prior authorization and that's, you know, a lot of work. So it, I'm with you that I, I wish that we could be, I guess, recommending this more to those that don't yeah. have diabetes. But right. the, the reality is not everyone can get access to one. And secondly, they're very they can be expensive if insurance isn't covering them. Yeah, they can. And I try to think about diabetic educators and places, a lot of um, um, health departments and that sort of thing. They have programs. So, yes, everyone. It, unfortunately, it isn't covered by most insurances. With what we're talking about with the diabetes epidemic, there's a good shot with one in three people that you're going to have a family member or someone who may be already dealing with blood sugar issues, too. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. you know, something to, to little bit, think about a little bit. But, you know, hopefully, you know, the awareness will, will be it will really be helpful to, to make that available to a little bit of everyone. But unfortunately, you're right, Drew, it isn't. Yeah. OK. OK. So I want to quickly get into supplements. But before we do, I wanted to mention um, AMPK. Yeah. And I, I know that you're very familiar with this. So I wanted you to sort of explain what, what this is and, and why are we talking about AMK, AMPK and how it relates to blood sugar? Oh, gosh, everyone. So, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big guy. So I am a, a practicing internist, as you mentioned, but I love cell biology, Drew. So when you think about AMPK, everyone, AMPK is a kinase. It's an enzyme. You all remember enzymes in science. It makes reactions happen. The reason why AMPK is so pivotal is because it does two important things when we talk about berberine, everyone. It helps to support the blood sugar, but it helps to do it in different ways. It helps to express the insulin receptor better so that it's more effective. Mm -hmm. um, it also helps to express LDL receptors for cholesterol to make sure that cholesterol is getting out of our blood, making sure that cholesterol is not being absorbed, making sure the cholesterol is being excreted. So this particular uh, kinase or enzyme yeah. does things that not only are important for our blood sugar to also help postprandial blood sugar. That means everyone after we eat, we all get this spike, but berberine helps to quell that as well, yes. which is what we want. Um, so when you talk about this one enzyme or kinase, what have you, it is so, so important for blood sugar support and cholesterol support. And yeah. it's important to understand this science so that when you start to see, um, when you start to take this, you can see what am I supposed to look for? with right. this, how this is doing for me and for my body. 
Right, right. And and the, the AMPK, if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, it, it tends to get activated when ATP levels or energy levels drop in the body. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. In fact, the AMPK, everyone, is adenosine monophosphate. That's one. ATP for exercise, everyone, there's yeah. three phosphates. So you're absolutely right, Drew. That's how it gets activated. Okay. And you mentioned berberine as being one compound which can help, uh, you know, increase levels of, of AMPK. Also, we should mention two basic things before we go into more supplements, and that is exercise and caloric restriction and yeah. fasting, right? Yeah. Those True. those are all tied in with helping True. activate AMPK as well, Absolutely. Uh, which go hand in hand with what we're talking about here, right? It's like no, it <laughs> exercise does. And, and fasting when needed. No, it does, Drew. And I'm glad you mentioned the fasting piece and the, some of the other things that didn't necessarily require only supplementation because doing some of the things we're talking about in addition to supplementation only heightens the benefit. Exactly. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that because fasting has become so important. And so many of my patients love talking about that also. Yeah. And actually, while we're on the fasting topic, I mean, it's so funny because you can get into that that rabbit hole of fasting and think to yourself, well, fasting is only good for me. Right. But mm -hmm. the, the more I research it, sometimes I'm, I'm coming across literature that's suggesting that fasting may not be good you know, to do like on a regular basis. Let's say you're right. doing intermittent fasting every right. single day. Right. What is your thought on on that of, of like, you know, quote, skipping breakfast yeah. and then eating your lunch and then having your dinner and then fasting through the night? What's, what's your thought on that? No, Guru Drew, you hit the nail right on the head. So it's one of these things, everyone, that, you know, something is good for you like this. It doesn't, you don't have to take it to this extreme sort of level. So when I talk about fasting, one of the things I always mention, look, breakfast is the biggest important part of our day, everyone. I mean, yeah. you've been asleep for eight hours, your body's working, your brain needs glucose, everything is working. You got to feed your body. You got to give it the energy that it lost overnight. Now, one of the things I talk about with fasting, kind of like you said, Drew, is that I tell them to give me four or five days a week. I don't even like mm -hmm. to block mm -hmm. them in because I, I like to, number one, with the fasting, it also depends on a bunch of other things. Are you a big exerciser? Or are you under a lot of S word? That's that stressed you. I never say the word. <laughs> are you under a lot of S word and that sort of thing? So I usually tell people, give me five days a week of intermittent fasting. And I don't even go crazy. What I typically do, Drew, is I try to, I kind of do a, an abbreviated um, intermittent fast where I try to stop all of my food by seven o'clock. Yes. So I try to squeeze mine in. It allows me to maybe have that one little cookie around seven o'clock that'll digest in time and it won't deposit in the abdomen um, <laughs> by, by, the, by the morning. But I like to do it that way. So it's kind of baby steps, everyone. So fasting yeah. does some really important things. But to your point, Drew, when you start to see that it's almost the negative effects when you do it too much, I typically see lots of times. Yeah. Yeah. And you said, you said one cookie, not a package of cookies. There you go. And I mean it too. You know, I look at the labels, everyone. And so, you know, I have this thing, I, I shit it. I'm going to reveal this only because we're all family. So I like these little chessmen cookies. Um, and I like, cause I'm a big tea guy. Like you said, I just came back from Europe. So I was in the perfect place for a tea cookie. So I look at that, everyone, it's like 120 grams of calories for three cookies. So once again, I'm familiar with this and we're thinking about it. So I realize that I can get away with that one if I want to towards my fasting window. So yeah. I can have fun with that. And so a lot of you can, too, with your little thing that, that you love to have as far as on the sweet side. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's where moderation comes in handy. Exactly. Right? Moderation is the key. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned you mentioned tea and I, yeah. I, I believe that green tea, I think it's EGC, EGCG, the compound in green tea Absolutely. also activates AMPK. Yep. Great call. You know that. And then there's also a couple of the compounds. I think there's alpha lipoic acid, ginseng and is there any more? No, and that's a good one. Alpha lipoic acid um, it activates the AMPK, but to your point, also supportive for blood sugar. For blood sugar, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it, it's absolutely a good call. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then um, I want to get into berberine in one moment here, but really quickly, I want to mention the, the phrase autophagy. We spoke about this many times in the podcast before, but all these things that we're talking about, like even the intermittent fasting, that's promoting this concept called autophagy which is really kind of like taking out the trash of each of your cells. It's allowing the body to sort of break down things that don't need to be there and then getting rid of it. So AMPK also improves or activates autophagy, which we really want as well. Absolutely. And that's a really, really big one to, to think about. Look, we go through our lives each and every day trying to rid our bodies of junk and trash that we can't control. Things that we can't control that we put hand to mouth, but then some other things that we can't control. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that autophagy is a huge part of making sure that we stay, as I like to say, healthy and whole. Exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned berberine. So I want, I want to jump in with berberine and, and why that's so good for, for blood sugar and uh, lipids and many other things as well. Um, there was a study, I believe it was in, in 2008, 2009, that actually did a head to head looking at berberine versus metformin. Mm -hmm. Metformin is a biguanide. That's a very common uh, anti-diabetic or, you know, glucose type drug that people use right. to help lower their blood sugar. It's also an anti-aging uh, yeah, that's medication that people yeah. use as well um, to, I believe, inhibits inhibits mTOR. Um, but, you know, in that study that looked at berberine versus metformin, interestingly enough, they, I don't know if you saw this, Ken, but they are, the, the doses are the same, right? You know, you use like metformin, 500 yeah. TID. Yep, yep. They also use berberine 500 15, milligrams yeah, three times a day as well. Yeah. I, I, I came across it the other day, so that's interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in that study, they found that there was a, um, a, a comparison there that happened between metformin and berberine, meaning they, did, they, they both did well at helping lower blood sugar. So that was really promising to see. And I think that's why berberine came on the scene, you know, especially in the last like three to five years, but really yeah. 10 years ago, plus that's when we really yeah. started having some research come in about berberine. Um, what else do you like about berberine and, and how it works with, with diabetes and blood sugar? So Drew, you're right. So that study was very interesting. And it was interesting in that you're, it was interesting that you pointed out the dosages were, were, the, were like almost identical. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that's, that's the thing I like about it, everyone, is that when you're sitting there, one of the things you try to do as a doctor, my Hippocratic oath is to do no harm. Yes. Um, and obviously, I'm not saying metformin does harm, but to your GI tract, sometimes you're going to say, oh, my gosh, doc, I want to kill you. You didn't tell me. So I always tell patients that with metformin, you know, you can get a lot more some GI things. It gets better in time. So I say all that to say that berberine kind of allowed me kind of another arrow in my quiver to be yeah. able to, to deal with diabetes um, and with blood sugar and that sort of thing. So yeah. it's nice to be able to offer something that I always will say, Drew, that's closer to the earth. Mm -hmm. um, with it being a plant-based ingredient as well. So it, it's nice to kind of be able to have that, uh, that balance. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I think of metformin as reserving that for, you know, treating diabetes if needed, right? You can, there you you can certainly treat diabetes, uh, with all the things we've been talking about today, including, you know, berberine, um, if, if people are really motivated to make some changes. Um, but I tend to, I tend to really like berberine for like that pre-diabetes condition, yep. Right. Where we're just kind of creeping up on the blood sugar and we yeah. know that we can help reverse that and get it back down. Um, no, so like it, the, I do the same, Drew. Exactly. exactly. Same thing. Yeah. And it's like it's it's overall, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. Right. So it, overall, right. it is well tolerated. I mean, sometimes you get the occasional GI upset from berberine, but that's pretty rare. You, know, it's yeah. like you see that, you know, once in a blue moon. Um, so it's a very safe compound. You can take it for extended periods of time. And uh, it also has a lipid lowering effect too, yeah. which, is, which is also very promising. Yeah. Uh, it can help sensitize, you know, insulin. So it can help with insulin resistance. And um, yeah, it's just, a, it's a really cool compound because uh, it comes from many different plants out there. I mean, people are probably familiar with uh, golden seal. Yeah. Uh, Oregon grape root grows yeah. all over the place here in the Pacific Northwest. That's right. Um, there's coptis, which is more of like the Chinese medicine version of it. And there's yeah. also um, barberry as well. And Barbary. And the thing I yeah. love uh, uh, about it is, you know, it's one of those things. Look, I'm a I'm a Western trained doc. We didn't talk about this in my in my one week of nutrition yeah. uh, when we when we went through uh, med school. So it was it's it's nice to be able to offer something that's like you said, the safety profile is wonderful. The the benefits are even more wonderful. And you're talking about something that's helping to support blood sugar. And we've already talked about what usually comes with that disrangement of your lipids, um, of your cholesterol, everyone, whether it's lowering your HDL, increasing yeah. your triglycerides, increasing the LDL. So the fact that berberine can do both of those things to support both of those things is huge, especially in my pre-diabetic. So I'm just like you in that sense, Drew, to where that prebiotic, uh, I'm sorry, that pre-diabetes uh, group gets that special kind of um, setup to start to keep them from some of the heavier things that may be required. Yeah, and I mean, you and I can, we can share our anecdotal experience with our patients all day and all night, but really right. like there are a ton of clinical studies that have been done on berberine to help show these benefits that we're talking about. So well-researched compound and um, yeah, I, I can't speak highly of, of it enough and obviously you can't either, so. Yeah, 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 you're very much preaching to the converted. So, uh, and, yeah. and, and I love that and to be able to have more. I mean, you know, this Ozempic challenge that's been out 
the best thing that's come from this, from this, from, from TikTok doc is the fact that millions of more people will now hear about berberine. They may yes. not have heard about it before yes. the Ozempic challenge kind of called uh, berberine nature's Ozempic. So um, it's great because the education is really growing around berberine. I think so many people are going to benefit from this um, from this compound. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm happy you mentioned Ozempic too because I, I think there there I think there's a time and a place for that medication, and yeah. I do believe that over time we will we'll have better substances out there that can be used for for weight loss. Um, but ber berberine is it's been around for a long time. We know it's safe and it's effective, and we should certainly be using it in this population. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anything else that you use in terms of supplements with your patients that might help support blood sugar? Anything else that comes to mind? You know, so it's interesting when you say that because one of the ones I always talk a lot about is vitamin D as well. Mm. Um, you know, vitamin D is important to support over 36 organs, 2000 genes. Um, and they, you know, there's receptors for vitamin D just about everywhere, everyone. And so I usually use vitamin D as well, Drew, to, to kind of balance things. It's almost like my balance. And the interesting thing is the level should be between 40 and 60. When yeah. we look at the levels, when you go to your doctors or even to a doctor, Western trained like myself, you look at the parameters and it says 30 is normal. And that's, that's only for bone health, everyone. That was for back in the day with rickets and that sort of thing. It's different now. So that 40 to 60 tends to be that sweet spot um, where you get the bigger benefits with, with vitamin D. So I always make sure that my patients, especially with blood sugar issues, um, and, and actually, honestly, with hypertension and cholesterol, which can go along with that, with the metabolic syndrome, yeah. that the vitamin D levels are where they need to be, along with the omega-3, um, which is also important for, for lipids. And Ken, maybe you can help me answer this question. I've been wondering this for a long time. Sure. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm, I'm going to try. Exactly. Here it is. So, you know, we have this level of vitamin D. A lot of people are low in it. I'd say, I don't know, maybe three out of five people I test are low. Yep. These are not folks that are lathering sunscreen on all the time. That's going to prevent conversion of vitamin D in the skin. Um, these are people who are getting out in the sun on a regular basis. Why are we seeing this like epidemic, so to speak, of low vitamin D? Do you have any... Yeah, reason I, do. For that. I do actually. That's a great question. So there's a few things going on. So one of the things I'd love to do, everyone, is also help help the elderly. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a huge population that doesn't get out uh, in the sun um, like that population you're mentioning. And then there's other people like myself who who have more melanin in their skin, um, whether mm -hmm. they're whether they're African-American or Latino or whichever. The point is the melanin blocks the sun's rays. So you'll find right. there's a the number one lowest group in vitamin D levels are African Americans followed by um, Latin Americans or Hispanics mm -hmm. second. So it's a little bit of that as well. Um, the other thing we're realizing is that we really don't have that much natural vitamin D in our diets. Yeah. One of the things we used to do back in the day, everywhere, I guess, it, you know, from the from the South, I mean, they'd always give you a, a teaspoon of um, cod liver oil. The reason why oh, they yeah. did that, right? It was you, you remember those days. And so it's about the, that fatty omega-3, but it's about vitamin D, natural vitamin D. So when you look around, there's not a lot of foods that are really naturally in vitamin D. People will say, oh, well, I take milk every day. Guess what? It's fortified. Doesn't yep. come naturally, guys. It's added. Um, so you look at your diet. You look at the elderly. You look at minorities who are big, you know, a big part of that. And then you look at those who do go out which is that balancing act, right? You go out, you're fair skin, you want to wear sunblock because you don't want to get any basal yeah. cell carcinomas and that sort of thing, yeah. but then it blocks the rays. So we're seeing and learning more about, gosh, you know, we don't have a lot in our diet and we have some people who are kind of set up to have low yeah. vitamin D. So that's part of the issue. So hopefully we're able yeah. to answer a couple of things. Yeah. Ken, you nailed it, man. That was great. That was great. Uh, well, look, as, as we wrap up here, I just wanted to leave our listeners with... Um, um, hope in the sense that if you yeah. if you are suffering with a blood sugar issue if you've got prediabetes even full-blown type 2 diabetes yep. uh, there's so much that you can do oh. to help improve you know glucose levels and really like you've seen this ken right i mean you've seen hemoglobin a1c's in the sevens high oh, six yeah. as oh. they come back down in normal range oh yeah you know over over a 12-month period it's possible everyone you can totally do this right and, like there's so many different things that you can use to get your blood sugar down but it is super important and uh, so many ways to kind of approach this. And I just want you to know that, you know, it can be done. It's possible. Absolutely. And one of the things I always love to say, especially when you deal with blood sugar, because everything is a lot of doom and gloom. I always say it's not your fault. Yes. It's not your fate. 
Um, and it's important to really, really feel that mantra because it's true. Um, we have so many things that we can do to really change your life. Um, and, and, and hopefully from even listening to us to do today too, Drew, we just, we just changed so many lives today. And so, you know, I'm happy you mentioned that. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us. We had an awesome discussion today. I can't wait to have you on again, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on, Drew. And uh, everyone have a great day and uh, we'll see you next time. We'd be well. Thanks for listening to this special presentation of Be Healthistic, presented by Healthy Directions. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, comment, and share wherever you listen or watch. To subscribe to our podcast or to listen to past episodes, visit our website at BeHealthisticPodcast.com. See you next time.